Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. I'm very glad also to be joined by June Rain of the MHRA and, and Chris Whitty. Our roadmap to freedom depends on the continued success of our vaccination programme, and so it's reasonable for people to want to be continually reassured, not only that our vaccines are safe and effective, but also that we have the supply that we need. So I want to address both points today, especially in the light of concerns you uh, may have heard in some other countries about the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. First, the Independent Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency has reviewed the evidence, as it does every week. They've confirmed that the benefits of the vaccine in preventing COVID far outweigh any risks, and people should continue to get their vaccine when asked to do so. And June will say a little bit more about that in a moment. It's also very important for our European friends that today the European Medicines Agency has come to a clear scientific conclusion, and I quote, this is a safe and effective vaccine. We also saw yesterday the evidence from Public Health England that a single dose of either vaccine provides 60% protection against getting COVID and reduces the chances of hospitalisation by 80% and the risk of death by 85%. So the Oxford jab is safe and the Pfizer jab is safe. The thing that isn't safe is catching COVID, which is why it's so important that we all get our jabs as soon as our turn comes. And as it happens, I'm getting mine tomorrow. And the centre where I'm getting jabbed is currently using the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine for those receiving their first dose. And that is the one I'll be having. And let me also assure you, if you come forwards after receiving your letter. We have the jabs for you. We've always said uh, that in a vaccination program of this pace and this scale, some interruptions in supply are inevitable. And it is true that in the short term, we're receiving fewer vaccines than we had planned for a week ago. Uh, that is because of a delay in a shipment from the Serum Institute, uh, who are doing a Herculean job in producing vaccines in such large quantities. And because of a batch that we currently have in the UK that needs to be retested as part of our rigorous safety program. So, as a result, we will receive slightly fewer vaccines in April than in March, but that is still more than we received in February. And the supply we do have will still enable us to hit the targets we have set. That means that by the 15th of April, we'll be able to offer a first dose to all of you who are over 50, as well as those under 50 who are clinically vulnerable. We will have the second doses that people need within the 12-week window, which means around 12 million people in April. And we will still offer a first dose to every adult by the end of July. So there is no change to the next steps of the roadmap. We've now vaccinated over 25 million people across our entire United Kingdom, more than the entire population of many countries, and our progress along the road to freedom continues unchecked. We remain on track to reclaim the things we love, to see our families and friends again, to return to our local pubs, our gyms and sports facilities, and uh, of course our shops. Uh, all, of course, as long as the data continue to go in the right direction and we meet our four tests. And the way to ensure that this happens is to get that jab when your turn comes. So let's get the jab done. Thank you very much. I'm now going to hand to, to June Ray. Thank you, Prime Minister, and good afternoon. The MHRA has been carrying out robust safety vigilance in tandem with the COVID-19 vaccination programme. Our role is to continually monitor safety during widespread use of a vaccine to confirm that they're performing as expected, to identify any new side effects that arise, and to ensure that the benefits continue to outweigh the risks. We've been able to gather a large amount of data 
on the safety profile of the available vaccines and have done a rigorous scientific review of all the available data with regards to suspected blood clots. Our review, alongside the critical assessment of leading independent scientists in the Commission on Human Medicines, shows that there is no difference that blood clots in veins are occurring more than would be expected in the absence of vaccination for either vaccine. The public can have every confidence in the thoroughness of our review. We have also received five reports of a different, a rare form of blood clot in the cerebral sinuses, cerebral sinus vein thrombosis, or CSVT, occurring together with lowered blood platelets shortly after vaccination with the COVID-19 vaccine AstraZeneca. This type of blood clot can rarely occur naturally in unvaccinated people, as well as in people with COVID-19 disease. A further review of these events is ongoing, but a causal relationship with the vaccine has not yet been established. And the rate of occurrence of these CSVT events among the 11 million people vaccinated is extremely rare. While we continue to investigate these cases as a precautionary measure, we would advise anyone with a headache that lasts more than four days after vaccination or bruising beyond the site of vaccination after a few days to seek medical attention. And we will communicate further on the outcome of this further review when it's complete. The MHRA assessed this data alongside the benefits of the vaccine in preventing COVID-19 with its associated risk of hospitalisation and death and determined that the benefits firmly remain to outweigh the risks. So you should continue to receive your vaccine when you get the call or the second dose as soon as you're contacted. And I want to end by expressing our sincere gratitude to those who have sent reports to the MHRA and remind everyone that you can report and you should report all suspected side effects to COVID-19 vaccines through the coronavirus yellow card scheme. Thank you, Prime Minister. Thank you very much, June. Uh, let's go to Chris. Anything to add to that? Thank you very much. Let's go to, let's go to Jane from Buckinghamshire. Good afternoon. Are the UK able to provide stats to prove that the AstraZeneca vaccine is safe and therefore alleviate the current fears of blood clots in the EU? Thank you. Thanks, Jane. I'm, I'm going to pass that straight back to, 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 to June and then to, to Chris. Yes, we can. We're committed to transparency. We publish every week all the suspected adverse drug reaction reports that we receive, and our report includes further information on any trends, and it will certainly communicate all the data and the stats around the particular issue of blood clots. Thank you. Uh, I mean, the thing I'd add to uh, what Dr. Raines just said uh, is firstly that all of medicine is about saying, look, what are the potential risks of the treatment? And everything that you take, every drug, every vaccine, every operation has going to have, have some risks, often very small, including drugs that people are very used to, like aspirin. So, for example, that can cause uh, clotting, uh, sorry, bleeding, that can cause a whole variety of problems. Uh, and yet we all would see that as a, a normal uh, drug that people would just have in their uh, their bathroom cabinet. So all drugs have some uh, side effects that are rare. The question is, are the benefits big enough to justify that? And what we have here, what Dr. Rain has laid out, is an incredibly small potential risk, and even this is a potential risk, not one that is certain. So five people out of the 11 uh, million that have been given the vaccine in the UK so far against the really very substantial protection that these vaccines give and that the AZ vaccine as well as the Pfizer vaccine give to people against this really common disease. And I think it's important to remind people that at this point in time, uh, we're still in a situation where the, uh, the, uh, the Office for National Statistics uh, think that one in 270 people uh, have got COVID. This is still a common disease and it is a very dangerous disease for many people. People dying, uh, people getting significant blood clotting problems, that's one of the risks of COVID, uh, people having long-term uh, physical and mental effects from COVID. So this is a very significant disease that is very common with a very effective uh, vaccine, two vaccines in the case of AZ and Pfizer, and real uh, 
issues that we always have to think about with all drugs, but they are so much smaller than the benefits of getting the vaccine. So it's, the risk benefit is really strongly in favour of getting vac vaccinated, uh, as the MHRA have said today, and as the EMA, the excellent uh, European Medicine Safety Agency, has also said today. So this is a universal view. It's also the view of the World Health Organization, WHO. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Barry from Burton-on-Trent. Barry asks, in the light of the European President, uh, the European Commission President, threatening to block the export of vaccines, how will this affect the general public who are waiting for the second dose of the Pfizer vaccine, which is, which is produced in, in Belgium? Uh, well, uh, Barry, thank you very much. Uh, I think that people should be uh, under uh, no uh, anxiety or no misapprehensions about that. We will get, a, get on and deliver all the, the second doses of the of the Pfizer, and um, it's, it's very important to stress whatever you uh, may hear about uh, the pressures that different countries are, are under to uh, deliver vaccines for their for their public. Um, this is these vaccines are a a multinational effort. They're produced as the result of international cooperation, and I want to stress that we in the UK uh, will continue to, uh, to, to view it in that spirit, and to, uh, we don't have any uh, bans on, uh, on exporting stuff, and we'll continue to cooperate with our, with our European friends. Uh, let's go to, to Fergus Walsh of the, of the BBC. Thank you, Prime Minister. Um, is there a danger that the unfounded concerns about the safety of the AstraZeneca vaccine might put some people off from having their jab? What would you say to them? And for Professor Whitty, how important is it that the under 50s uh, get immunised as soon as possible? Thanks. Well, Fergus, I think the, the best testimony uh, that I can offer about the, the safety of the, uh, of the Pfizer and the Oxford AstraZeneca, which seem to be pretty much identical in, in safety terms, is, is really what you've heard uh, just now from uh, Dr. Rain and, and, and Professor Whitty. I think that they are, uh, you know, uh, uh, medical professionals who, uh, whose, whose view it is that these are safe and effective vaccines, and that's been confirmed today uh, by the European Medicines Agency. And I think that's a, I think a, a, a voice that will be heard around the whole of the uh, of the European Union, and that's that's all to the good. Um, I mean, I just to add to that. Uh the, the overwhelming professional view of doctors around the world and other health professionals is these vaccines are highly effective against a dangerous uh, infection that is common, uh, and they are safe very safe relative to the risk of the infection. So uh, the first thing is to say there's a very strong uh, professional consensus on that. And it is clear that the British public also have taken that message. And if you look at the numbers that people have coming forward, forward for vaccination, uh, well over 90% in the age groups that have gone through their vaccination have chosen to take this up. So there is the, the general public is, uh, as always, sensible and steady on this. They understand this is a dangerous disease, an effective vaccine, uh, and one that's got uh, very low uh, side effects compared to the risk of catching the disease. In terms of the, over, the under 50s, uh, we, we, um, the, the biggest risk, uh, as everyone uh, will by now know, is in those who are older or have health conditions. So it's quite right that those were, uh, were prioritised and the JCVI prioritisation made that clear. And in terms of people who, ha who have sadly died from uh, COVID, 99% uh, of people who died would have come from either people over 50 or with pre-existing health conditions who are in the groups that are currently vaccinated. So that was the absolute priority. And we know that a second vaccine on top of the first adds to the protection. So it is really important that uh, people who are invited for a second vaccination uh, come and get it, and then in particular these people in the, in the first, uh, the uh, JCVI groups 1 to 9, the people over 50 and with health conditions, so really important they do that. Once those are vaccinated, it is also very important we start going down the ages because people can continue to have significant health problems uh, in their 40s, 30s, 20s and occasionally even younger than that. But uh, so, uh, it decreases over age, but there's still significant health problems all the way through. So it will be critical that once we got through the first group, who are the ones who are most at risk, uh, we go on to uh, 
do this protection. And it does one additional thing, which is the higher the proportion of the population are vaccinated, the, the smaller the risk to everybody. So by va being vaccinated, someone protects themselves. And if they take the second vaccine, they protect themselves even more. Uh, but if they also have the vaccination, they reduce the risk of passing on COVID to people around them. So that's what we really want, is everyone to be vaccinated for their own protection. Uh, and if everybody is protected, that also protects everyone else in society. Thanks, Fergus. Emily Morgan, ITV. Thank you, Prime Minister. Um, you said that there's no change to the roadmap, but you have also said in the past that we will only move to the next phase of easing of lockdown if we pass for tests. Doesn't this vaccine supply issue mean that we are actually going to fail the first test, which is the continued successful deployment of the vaccine? Uh, no, uh, is uh, I think the short answer to that. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be able to, uh, to meet our targets in, in exactly the way that uh, that I described by by April the 12th and by uh, and by July, and that's the that's the crucial thing. And that will enable us to get on with uh, the the steps on the timetable that uh, that we've set out. So uh, April the the 12th, May the 17th, uh, uh, June the 21st, we will continue all the uh, the unlockings that uh, uh, that I've set out. If if the uh, the the four tests, uh, as I've said, continue continue to be met. Thank you very much, uh, Tom Newton Dunn, Times Radio. Thank you, Prime Minister. Question for uh, Professor Whitty. Are vaccine centres, GPs, whoever, banned from administering vaccines to under 50s if they have stock left over, if they've done all their group sixes, if they've done all their over 50s? And question to you, Prime Minister, on India's role in stopping the Serum Institute from exporting 4 million doses, as you just said they, uh, they've just done, what was the Indian government's role in that? Do you know? And furthermore, if they have indeed stopped the Serum Institute from exporting 4 million doses to us, is that not the same vaccine national nationalism that you're quick to call the EU out on have been silent so far over India? Um, Chris? I, I mean, the, the, re, the NHS has been really clear that what they want to do is to prioritise the people in the, the over 50s and those in the high risk groups, plus health and social care workers uh, and uh, carers of vulnerable people. And they've done that for a really obvious reason that I think everybody accepts. And what the, those leading this have said, and I completely agree with this, is we must, at this point, really prioritise uh, the possibility that we don't miss anybody, leave anyone behind, because we're racing down the ages. And just to give uh, a uh, something, you know, the, the Society of Actuaries gave some numbers on this to explain why this is so important. And what they, showed, what they said was that if, uh, if you assume the vaccine was completely effective, which isn't completely effective, but very close to, uh, very, very close to that uh, for practical purposes, you would need to vaccinate uh, 20 people in the highest risk uh, group to actually uh, prevent one death. By the time we get down to the ones, people in their 50s who are otherwise well, don't have other, have other problems, uh, you need to vaccinate 8,000 people to actually prevent one death. The point I'm making is the key priority at the moment is to find all the people who've not yet had the opportunity to be op offered a vaccine in the highest risk groups, complete on that, and then we absolutely then want to go down further down the ages. Uh, but that's the, that's the reason for the decisions. Yeah, and Tom, on, on your question about the Serum Institute of India, I, I want to thank the, the Serum Institute of India uh, for their heroic role in producing huge quantities of, uh, of vaccine, and, uh, and the Indian government hasn't uh, stopped uh, uh, any export. There is, there is a delay, as, as I've described, as, as there is... Uh, very frequently in vaccine rollout programs, but this is, believe me, by no means the end of the story of uh, the UK's uh, relationship with uh, the Serum Institute of India, and uh, and you know we hope to make uh, further progress over the over the weeks and, and months ahead. There is there is a huge amount of work that we want to do together, and this is this is just the beginning. Thanks very much, uh, Tom. I think you wanted to come back on something. I think we got, we got to, we, do you want to come back there, Tom? Very quickly, yeah. Yes. Is the Indian government responsible for that delay, if not a ban? Have the Indian government delayed that export? No, no, no. The, 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 there, is, there, is a, there, is, there is a delay, as there, as there often is, uh, cause for, for various technical reasons. Uh, uh, but 
we hoped, as, as I've said, to continue to work very closely with the uh, Serum Institute of India and indeed with partners around the world, including uh, on, the, on the European continent. So this is a, this is a, a big international effort. Uh, we're going to continue uh, as, as the UK uh, to, be, to be global in our outlook, as, as you would expect us uh, to be. Um, Steve Swinford, The Times. Uh, Prime Minister, you've previously called for an amnesty for migrants who are in the UK illegally. How comfortable are you with the idea of sending asylum seekers overseas for processing? Uh, and Professor Whitty, the latest figures suggest that just one in 16,000 tests on school children have come back positive. How confident are you that we'll be able to proceed with the easing of the lockdown on April the 12th? Steve, the, the first uh, point about uh, the illegal immigration into into the UK uh, is that, and you're, you're perfectly right. I think when uh, when uh, people have been here for for a very long time uh, and haven't fall, fallen foul of the of the law, uh, then it makes sense to try to regularise their status. But that actually is is pretty much what already happens under 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 the existing rules. But when it comes to uh, what the Home Secretary was was setting out, uh, I, I want to be clear: the objective here. Is to is to save life and avert human misery because people are crossing the channel uh, who are being fooled, who are being uh, conned by uh, gangsters into paying huge sums of money, uh, risking their lives. People have died making this, uh, trying to make this crossing, and it is a. a a, a deeply repugnant uh, traffic that we we need to stop, and that's why the Home Secretary has set out the the tough series of, of proposals that that you've seen. But the objective is a humanitarian and uh, one and a, a humane one, which is to to, to stop the uh, the abuse of these people by uh, by a bunch of traffickers and and gangsters. That's what we're we're trying to do. Thanks. Thanks very much. I, I sorry, on schools, yeah. sorry, sorry, Chris. Um, on, on schools, uh, just three points to make. I mean, the first of which is a huge thank you to teachers and other school staff who have done a really terrific job in making it uh, as safe as possible for to, uh, all children to come back. And remembering, of course, that uh, children are not the group who are heavily affected by this uh, by this in, in this infection, but they are important in potentially in the transmission. And what they're doing uh, in the schools is really going to benefit the students. Uh, the staff uh, and wider society. Uh, in terms of, um, uh, we are expecting that schools going back uh, will put some upward pressure on R. We've said that right from the beginning. That's, that was an accepted thing that that is likely to happen. Uh, but the uh, the roadmap was planned with that. Uh, possibility absolutely in mind when the Prime Minister announced it uh, and what he also said and this is just reiterating what he said was he wants and ministers want to be based on uh, data not dates and we have not yet got to the point we can see the, the full impact of the school uh, uh, the schools being open again uh, and therefore what we will need to do is to relook at the data once it comes in but it takes a while for the data fully to reveal itself and to be properly analysed in a way that the Prime Minister and other ministers can make a decision so it is important that we stick to this data not dates approach but there's nothing at the moment that is uh, flashing red lights beyond what you'd expect which is of course when the schools open there is slightly greater in, uh, possibility of transmission we'll just have to see what the data show. Thanks. I just say, Steve, on, on schools. I was actually at a school in my a primary school in my constituency today, and the the feeling there was they were so glad to be to be back. Uh, it was obvious from the what all the the pupils said. And I want to I want to echo what Chris said. I want to thank all the teachers uh, who've done an amazing amount of work getting their their schools ready. Uh, all the parents who put up with uh, lockdown for so long and, work, and worked so hard. And uh, I think that the, I think I'm right in saying that the uh, attendance today is actually higher than we would normally expect it uh, to be uh, at this time of year and uh, it was it was very very good to see the the enthusiasm for for being back at school and and uh, the the steps that uh, schools are still taking to um, and rightly taking to ensure that uh, it's covid secure uh, mesa hall of the express uh, thank you, Prime Minister. Uh, if I can ask uh, Professor Whitty, have you seen any evidence uh, that the suspension of the Oxford vaccine in some European 
countries has had any impact here in terms of people not turning up for appointments or perhaps asking for an alternative if they do. And uh, Prime Minister, next week is the anniversary of the start of the first lockdown. Uh, I think you've said that you'll privately uh, observe a minute's silence as the uh, Marie Curie charity has, has asked people to do. Sh should we see it as a, as a national day of commemoration for those that we've lost in this pandemic? And have you given any more thought to a permanent memorial to them? Uh, on the question you asked me, I, I mean, there are anecdotal reports, which I'm sure will be accurate, that um, in some places a few people have not uh, turned up immediately after they heard the news. Uh, I suspect a lot of them will think about it, see the very reassuring data that the MHRA has given, that Dr. Rain laid out earlier, the very reassuring points that the World Health Organization made, the very reassuring things that the European Medicines Agency made, and the overwhelming view of the medical and nursing and other health professions and they will realize that this is something that having had a pause for thought they want to do but the numbers were very small who did that actually almost record numbers have been going through in terms of numbers of people taking up the vaccine there, overall there is no evidence of a significant problem that people do not want vaccination and anybody who is doubtful about this I would encourage them just to think through the dangers of COVID how common it is and the safety of the vaccines this is something they absolutely is in their interests as well as everyone around them's interests uh, for them to take yeah and Mesa on the anniversary of course I'll be marking it uh, as I'm sure uh, millions of others will around the country uh, and uh, on the uh, idea for a national memorial um, uh, yes we will certainly be pursuing that and a lot of good uh, suggestions have already uh, already come in and you'll be you'll be hearing more, more about that in in due course uh, let's go to uh, Alex Brown of the Scotsman good evening uh, for you Prime Minister when will cross-border travel be relaxed enough for the 800,000 Scots in England to go home and see their families again? And secondly, do you think Nicola Sturgeon should resign if she broke the ministerial code? And would you expect the same of your own ministers? Uh, well, uh, Alex, I, I hope very much that uh, we'll be able to uh, move around as one uh, United Kingdom according to the timetable set out on the, uh, on the roadmap, and I hope that uh, uh, everybody will show common sense in application of the rules uh, around the country. And as I've said earlier, earlier on, uh, there's no change to the roadmap uh, uh, as a result of anything uh, to do with the uh, vaccine rollout, which continues, uh, which continues use well and uh, I think your second question was an attempt to uh, <laughs> get me uh, quite properly uh, to get me to comment on something which I think uh, uh, is properly and rightly left uh, uh, to uh, the uh, Parliament in uh, in Scotland to, to address and to, and to the, the Scottish electorate. Okay everybody thank you very much thank you. Thank you.